This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 3 Death to Politics If politics were only the politics of politicians, it would be enough to turn off the TV and the radio to no longer hear it talked about. But it so happens that France, which is the country of human rights, only for show, is well and truly the country of power. All social relations in France are power relations, and in this country, what has not been socialized? So that there is politics at every level, in the associations and in the collectives, in the villages and the corporations, in the milieus, all the milieus. It's at work everywhere, maneuvering, operating, seeking appreciation. It never speaks honestly, because it is afraid. Politics, in France, is a cultural disease. Anytime people get together, no matter what's at issue, no matter what the purpose is, and provided it lasts for a while, it takes on the structure of a little court society. And there is always someone who takes himself for the Sun King. Those who reproach Foucault for having developed a rather stifling ontology of power in which goodness, love of one's neighbor, and the Christian virtues have a difficult time finding their place, should reproach him rather for having thought in an admirable way, but perhaps in a way that is a bit too French. France, thus, remains a court society. At the summit of the state, even in the milieus that declare its perdition most radically, as if the Ancien Régime, as a system of mores, had never died as if the French Revolution had only been a perverse stratagem for maintaining the Ancien Régime everywhere, behind the change of phraseology, and for protecting it from attack, since it's supposed to have been abolished. Those who claim that a local politics, closer to the territories and the people, is what will save us from the decomposition of national politics, can defend such an insanity only by holding their noses because it's evident that what they offer is only a less professional, cruder, and, in a word, degenerate version of what there is. For us, it's not a matter of doing politics differently, but of doing something different from politics. Politics makes one empty and greedy. This national syndrome obviously doesn't spare the radical militant milieus. Each little group imagine it is capturing parts of the radicality market from its closest rivals by slandering them as much as possible. By lusting after the pieces of the cake of others, it ends up spoiling the cake and smelling of shit. A clear-headed and completely unresigned militant recently gave this testimony. Today, I know that the disinterested militancy doesn't exist. Our upbringing, our schooling, our family, our social world as a whole rarely make us into well-rounded and serene personalities. We're full of hurts, existential issues to be resolved, relational expectations, and it's with this inner baggage that we enter into militant life. Through our struggles, we're all looking for something else, for gratifications, recognition, social and friendly relations human warmth, meaning to give to our life. In, the most militant, in most militants, this search for gratifications remains rather discreet. It doesn't take up all the space. In certain persons, it should be said, it occupies a disproportionate space. We can all think of examples of militants constantly monopolizing the talk or trying to control everything, of others putting on a performance or always playing on people's feelings, of others who are especially sensitive, very aggressive, or preemptory in the ways they express themselves. These problems of recognition, gratifications, or power seem to me to explain single-handedly the majority of conflicts in radical groups. In my view, many apparently political conflicts mask conflicts of ego between persons. That's my hypothesis. It's not necessarily correct. But from my experience, I have the strong feeling 
that something else is at play in these meetings, the mobilizations, the radical organizations, something else other than the struggle, properly speaking. A veritable human theater with its comedies, its tragedies, with its smooth merivodages, which often push the political objectives which supposedly brought us together into the background. This country is a heartbreaker for serene souls. Nuit de Beau in Paris was many things. It was a rallying point and a starting point for all sorts of incredible actions. It was the site of wonderful encounters, of informal conversations, of reunions after the demonstrations. By offering a continuity between the leapfrog demonstration dates, which the Union Confederations are so fond of, Nuit de Beau enabled the conflict triggered by the Loi Travaillé to be something altogether different, and more than a classic social movement. Nuit de Beau made it possible to thwart the mundane governmental operation consisting in reducing its opponents to powerlessness by setting them at odds with each other under the categories of violent and nonviolent. Although it was rechristened Place de la Commune, Place de la République was not able to deploy the smallest embryo of what was commune-like in the squares movement, in Spain or in Greece, to say nothing of Tahrir Square, simply because we didn't have the strength to impose a real occupation of the square on the police. But if there was a fundamental defect in Nuit de Beau from the start, it was on the pretext of going beyond classical politics, the way in which it reproduced and staged the latter principal axiom according to which politics is a particular sphere, separate from life, an activity consisting in speaking, debating, and voting, with the result that Nuit de Beau came to resemble an imaginary parliament, a kind of legislative organ with no executive function, and hence a manifestation of powerlessness that was sure to please the media and the governing authorities. One participant sums up what happened, or rather what didn't happen, at Nuit de Beau. The only shared position, perhaps, is the desire for an endless discussion. The unsaid and the vague have always been privileged to the detriment of taking a position, which would be selective by definition, hence supposedly non-inclusive. Another offers the following appraisal. A succession of speeches limited to two minutes and never followed by any discussion could not fail to be tiresome. Once the surprise had worn off at seeing so many people excited about expressing themselves, the absence of anything at stake started to empty these meetings of the sense that they appeared to have. We were here to be together, but the rules separated us. We were here to exorcise the curse of our respective solitudes, but the assemblies gave the curse a glaring visibility. For me, the assembly should be the place where the collective is experienced, felt, explored, confirmed, and finally, if only in a punctual way, declared. But for that, it would have been necessary for real discussions to occur. The problem was that we didn't talk to each other. We only spoke one after the other. The worst of what we meant to avert on the place unfolded there in a general incomprehension a collective impotence that mistakes the spectacle of solitudes for the invention of an active collective. A conjuration of blockades finally got the better of my patience. The key person of our committee, no doubt without any intentional ill will on her part, had a special gift for discouraging, with all sorts of logistic and procedural quibbles, every attempt to reintroduce some stakes into the functioning of the assemblies. And finally, like so many others, I sometimes had the impression that there was a kind of opaque power structure that furnished the major orientations of the movement, that there was another level of decision-making than that of the ordinary assemblies, the micro-bureaucracy that ran Nuit de Boue in Paris, and that was literally a bureaucracy of the microphone, was caught in this uncomfortable situation that it could only roll out its vertical strategies hidden between the spectacle of horizontality. 
presented each day at 6 p.m. by the sovereign assembly of emptiness that was held there, with its changing walk-on actors. That is why what was said there basically didn't matter much, and least of all to its organizers. Their ambitions and strategies were deployed elsewhere than on the square, and in a language whose cynicism could be given free reign only on the terrace of a hipster cafe, in the last stage of intoxication between accomplices. Nuit Debout showed in an exemplary way how direct democracy, collective intelligence, horizontality, and hyperformalism could function as a means of control and a method of sabotage. This might seem dreadful, but Nuit Debout, nearly everywhere in France, illustrated line by line what was said about the movement of the squares into our friends, and was judged to be so scandalous by many militants at the moment of its publication. To the point that, since the summer of 2016, every time an assembly begins to turn in circles, and nothing is said beyond a rambling succession of leftist monologues, there's almost always someone who will shout, No, please, not Nuit Debout. This is the huge credit that must be granted Nuit Debout. It made the misery of assemblyism not just a theoretical certainty, but a shared experience. But in the fantasy of the assembly and decision-making, there's clearly something that escapes any argument. This has to do with the fact that the fantasy is implanted deeply in life, and not at the surface of political convictions. At bottom, the problem of political decision-making only redoubles and displaces to a collective scale what is already an illusion in the individual, the belief that our actions, our thoughts, our gestures, our words, and our behaviors result from decisions emanating from a central conscious and sovereign entity, the self. The fantasy of the sovereignty of the assembly only repeats on the collective plane the sovereignty of the self. When one knows all that monarchy owes to the development of the notion of sovereignty, one is sometimes led to wonder if the myth of the self is not simply the theory of the subject that royalty imposed wherever it prevailed in practice. Can you say that one again? Yeah. <clears throat> when one knows all that monarchy owes to the development of the notion of sovereignty, one is sometimes led to wonder if the myth of the self is not simply a theory of the subject that royalty imposed wherever it prevailed in practice. Indeed, for the king, to be able to rule from his throne in the middle of the country, the self must be enthroned in the middle of the world. One better understands, therefore, where the unbelievable narcissism of the general assemblies of Nuit Debu comes from. It's the thing, moreover, that's ended up killing them by making them the site, in speech after speech, of repeated outbursts of individual narcissism, which is to say, outbursts of powerlessness. From terrorist attacks to the German wing crash, people have forgotten that the first French mass killer of the new century, Richard Dern, at Nanterre in 2002, was a man literally disgusted with politics. He had passed through the Socialist Party before joining the Greens. He was an activist with the Human Rights League. He had made the Genoa alter globalization switch in July of 2011. In the end, he had taken a Glock and, on March 27, 2002, opened fire on the Municipal Council of Nanterre, killing eight elected officials and wounding 19 others. In his private journal, he wrote, I'm tired of always having in my head the sentence that keeps repeating. I haven't lived. I haven't lived at all at the age of 30. Why continue to pretend to live? I can only feel myself living for a few moments by killing. Dylan Klebold, one of the two conspirators of Columbine High School, confided to his notebooks, The meek are trampled on, the assholes prevail, the gods are deceiving. Farther and farther distant, that's what's happening. 
Me and everything that zombies consider real, just images, not life. The zombies and their society band together and try to destroy what is superior and what they don't understand and what they are afraid of. There you have some people who clearly took revenge instead of continuing to stew in their resentment. They dealt death and destruction because they didn't see life anywhere. A point has been reached where it's become impossible to maintain that the existential pertains to private life. Every new attack reminds us the existential has a power of political eruption. This is the big lie, and the great disaster of politics, to place politics on one side and life on the other. On one side, what is said but isn't real, and on the other, what is lived but can no longer be said. There are the speeches of the Prime Minister and, for a century now, the barbed satire of the canard in shame. There are the tirades of the great militant, and there's the way he treats his fellow human beings, with whom he allows himself to conduct himself all the more miserably as he takes himself to be politically irreproachable. There's the sphere of the sayable and the voiceless, orphaned, mutilated life. And that takes to crying out because it no longer serves any purpose to speak. Hell is really the place where all speech is rendered meaningless. What is called debate nowadays is just the civilized murder of speech. Official politics has become so manifestly a repugnant sphere of deception that the only events still happening in that sphere reduced down to a paradoxical expression of the hatred of politics. If Donald Trump is truly a figure of hatred, it's because he is first and foremost a figure of the hatred of politics. And it's this hatred that carried him to power. Politics in its totality is what plays into the hands of the National Front, and not the Cassures or the Benoit rioters. What the media, the card-carrying militants, and the governments cannot forgive the so-called cassures and other black blocs is, one, proving that powerlessness is not a destiny, which constitutes a galling insult for all those who are content to grumble and who prefer to see the rioters, contrary to any evidence, as infiltrated agents paid by the banks to aid the government. Two, showing that one can act politically without doing politics, at any point in life, and at the price of a little courage. What the Cassures demonstrate by their actions is that acting politically is not a question of discourse, but of gestures. And they attest this down to the words they spray paint on the walls of the cities. Politique should never have become a noun. It should have remained an adjective, an attribute, not a substance. There are conflicts, there are encounters, there are actions, there are speech interventions that are political, because they make a decisive stand against something in a given situation, and because they express an affirmation concerning the world they desire. Political is that which bursts forth, which forms an event, which punches a hole in the orderly progression of the disaster. That which provokes polarization, drawing a line, choosing sides. But there's no such thing as politics. There's no specific domain that would gather up all these events, all these eruptions, independently of the place and the moment in which they appear. There's no particular sphere where it would be a question of the affairs of everyone. There's no sphere separate from what is general. It suffices to formulate the matter to expose the fraud. Everything is political that relates to the encounter, the friction, or the conflict between forms of life, between regimes of perception, between sensibilities, between worlds once this contact attains a certain threshold of intensity. The crossing of this threshold is signaled immediately by its effects. Front lines are drawn, friendships and enmities are affirmed, cracks appear in the uniform surface of the social, 
there is a splitting apart of what was falsely joined together and subsurface communications between the different resulting fragments. What occurred in the spring of 2016 in France was not a social movement, but a political conflict, in the same way as 1968. This is shown by its effects, by the irreversibilities that it produced, by the lives that it caused to take a different path, by the desertions it determined, by the shared sensibility that is being affirmed, since then in a part of the youth and beyond. A generation could very well become ungovernable. These effects are making themselves felt, even in the ranks of the Socialist Party, in the split between the fractions that polarized at the time, in the fissure that condemns it to eventual implosion. Do they mean factions? Social movements have a structure, a liturgy, a protocol that define as excessive everything that escapes their bounds. Now not only did this conflict not cease to outstrip all the constraints, whether political, union, or police in nature, but it was basically nothing but an uninterrupted series of surges. An uninterrupted series of surges which the old, worn-out forms of politics tried hopelessly to catch up with. The first call to demonstrate on March 9, 2016, was a bypassing of the unions by YouTubers, where the former had no choice but to follow the latter if they meant to preserve some reason for being. The subsequent demonstrations saw the continual overrunning of the processions by young people who positioned themselves in the lead. The Nuit de Boue initiative itself went beyond any recognized framework for mobilization. The free marches, starting from the Place de la République, such as the aperitif at Vale's house, were a spillover from Nuit de Boue in their turn, and so on. The only movement demand, the repeal of the Loi Travailler, was not really one, since it left no room for any adjustments, for any dialogue. With its entirely negative character, it only signified the refusal to continue being governed in this manner, and for some the refusal to be governed, period. No one here, neither from the government nor among the demonstrators, was open to the least negotiation. Back in the days of the dialectic and the social, conflict was always a moment of dialogue. But here, the semblances of dialogue were simply maneuvers for the state bureaucracy and the union bureaucracy alike. It was a matter of marginalizing the party that was eternally absent from all the negotiating tables, the party of the street, which this time was the whole enchilada. It was a frontal shock between two forces, government against demonstrators, between two worlds and two ideas of the world, a world of profiteers presided over by a few profiteers in chief, and a world made up of many worlds, where one can breathe and dance and live. Right at the outset, the slogan, The World or Nothing, expressed what was at issue in reality. The Loi Travailler never formed the terrain of struggle, but rather its detonator. There could never be any final reconciliation. There could only be a provisional winner and a loser bent on revenge. What is revealed in every political eruption is the irreducible human plurality, the unsinkable heterogeneity of ways of being and doing, the impossibility of the slightest totalization. For every civilization motivated by the drive towards the one, this will always be a scandal. There are no strictly political words or language. There is only a political use of language in situation, in the face of a determinate adversity. That a rock is thrown at a riot cop does not make it a political rock, nor are there any political entities such as France, a party, or a man. What is political about them is the inner conflictuality that troubles them. It's the tension between the antagonistic components that constitute them, at the moment when the beautiful image of their unity breaks into pieces. 
We need to abandon the idea that there is politics only where there is vision, program, project, and perspective, where there is a goal, decisions to be made, and problems to be solved. What is truly political is only what emerges from life and what makes it a definite oriented reality. And it is born from what is nearby and not from a projection towards the far distant. The nearby doesn't mean the restricted, the limited, the narrow, the local. It means rather what is in tune, vibrant, adequate, present, sensible, luminous, and familiar the prehensible and the comprehensible. It's not a spatial notion, but an ethical one. Geographic distance is unable to remove us from that which we feel to be near. Conversely, being neighbors doesn't always make us close. It's only from contact that the friend and the enemy are discovered. A political situation does not result from a decision, but from the shock or the meeting between several decisions. Whoever starts from the nearby doesn't forego what is distant, they simply give themselves a chance to get there. For it's always from the here and now that the far away is given. It's always here that the distant touches us and that we care about it. And this holds true in spite of the estrangement power of images, cybernetics, and the social. A real political force can be constructed only from near to near, from moment to moment, and not through a mere statement of purposes. Besides, determining ends is still a means. One uses means only in a situation. Even a marathon is always run step by step. This way of situating what is political in the nearby, which is not the domestic, is the most precious contribution of a certain autonomous feminism. In its time, it threw the ideology of entire leftist parties, armed ones, into a crisis. The fact that feminists subsequently contributed to redistancing the nearby, the everyday, by ideologizing it, by politicizing it externally, discursively, constitutes the part of the feminist legacy that one can very well decline to accept. And to be sure, everything in this world is designed to distract us from what is there, very close. The everyday is predisposed to be the place which a certain stiffness would like to preserve from conflicts and affects that are too intense. It's precisely that very cowardice that lets everything slide and ends up making the everyday so sticky and our relations so viscous. If we were more serene, more sure of ourselves, if we had less fear of conflict and of the disruption an encounter might bring, their consequences would likely be less disagreeable, and perhaps not disagreeable at all. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.